Good morning. I shall be starting shortly. Good morning and welcome to Microcontrollers with Kinger North. I'm your host, Kinger North, and today we're going to be doing another little topic that's uh, interesting and allows for a lot of growth, and it's Let's Talk I Squared C, Communications in CircuitPython and Arduino. So let us have a look at what we're going to be using today, and let's talk about this. So here's a selection of items that I have out for today. Now, I'm not going to be hooking all of these up. I am I do have a few of them hooked up already and I'm going to talk about them and I'm going to talk about using different devices but let's talk about I squared C first of all and it is pronounced I squared C I know it's spelt I two C but the two stands for another I so it's I squared C that's how it's usually referred to as sometimes you'll see it as I I C some people will say I two C but it's I squared C that's just the way they prefer it to be uh, sounded by the people who created it, the person who created it actually, well back in time. This is a communications protocol. And it is a two wire protocol, meaning that we actually use two wires for both talking and receiving. So talking and listening on. And that is done quite simply. And it's done through a, uh, a multi-step process, but it is actually relatively simple. And it's so common that it actually has been around for quite some time. So what I'm going to show you here is that let me show you some of the items and what makes it so popular is the fact that it's actually relatively easy to set up because what you have here is it's built from two parts. You need a master and a slave. And what that means is somebody who is controlling the flow of communications and then others that are responding to the communications. Now, in this protocol, the master is contained either here on the Uno or on the Feather M4 Express. These two devices are the microcontrollers. They actually are the masters. So that's where the master is going to be located. And you can have more than one master in a circuit, although we don't very often see it. Um, in some cases, more than one master is used. And then we have the slaves. The slaves are just a bunch of addresses out there. These around here are all I squared C slaves, including this little board right here. What that means is, is they are connected with two wires of communications and two other wires. And the two other wires are just power and ground. And they're typically five volts if it's an Uno. Sometimes it's 3.3 or five volts if it's on the Feather M4 Express. It depends on your board. Some boards will take either voltage, some boards only like the one voltage and you have to go to each individual board specifications to find that out. The other two wires are the communication. In this case here I use blue and yellow for the communication wires to make them stand out. My red is my power lead either 5 volts or 3 volts and my black is my ground or common. That goes out to every board because every board has a chip on it, a smart chip. So they all have to be able to talk. And then the communications are actually only handled by this blue and yellow wire that come off the board. And they are connected to two pins on the controller that are usually labeled as SCL and SDA. And what that's talking about is, is that SCL is a clock chip. What that does is supply the pulse and it's the pulse rate at which we're going to communicate. Now this is variable, but we normally just leave it set up for the masters and we leave the default settings and it usually works for most of our cases. If you have some problems where you're either losing communications or it seems too slow, you can adjust the speed that the clock runs at. But we're not going to get into that here. You have to get into the details of how to set that up. But just know that can be set up. And then the other thing is, is the SDA. Now the SDA is the data line or data line, however you want to say it. And that one passes the information back and forth. And it works very much like mailing a letter is the way this works. 
And that's the way I like to look at it. When you're actually putting something in there, you drop a letter and you put it into the post and you put it into the uh, postal box, and it gets sent through a network of transportation methods, whether it be a hand carrier to a sorting plant to a vehicle to another hand carrier delivered to the address that you're looking for. And the whole idea is is that it is in address that's attached to it. So that's the first thing that you're going to have in any of these messages that come across is you have this address and this address. They're each one of these items that are connected, to connect them all at the same time, every one of these would have to have a unique address. We don't want any conflicts of address. Just think if you're sending a letter and you're sending it to address 42, and two houses on the same street had address 42, you wouldn't know where to deliver the mail. And that's the same thing here. It gets confused if there's more than one address of the same on a communication network here. So everything needs a unique address. So that's the first thing we have to keep in mind. And then after that, once we send the address is the person or the device that sees that address and says, hey, that's me, then looks at the data that's attached to it. And that data will either be a parameter that's being sent to the device, telling the device how to work, or it may be requesting information from that device. And whichever the case is, the device will do whatever it's been told to do. It will either do something with that information you, you sent it as if it's one of these displays, like we talked about last week, the LCD, I ran it over I squared C. If it receives the information, it will display that information on the screen. These two are also screens. These are what they refer to as OLED or organic LEDs. And these ones here will do the same thing. But some of these other devices don't have screens. But what they do have is they actually have information that's contained within the chip because they're designed to do specific functions. And that information is transmitted back to the microprocessor and then we use it however. So it sends it back in a format back to the master and says, hey, this is me, here's the information you requested. So very quickly, some of the devices that we have on this board here, I already mentioned, this is an OLED screen this one is made with a feather format that uh, was designed by Adafruit. That plugs into a same board. It has the same pattern as our M4 Express, which is also designed by Adafruit. So that's one board. So let me put that out of the way. Of course, we saw the big display last week. This was your I2C. This is the one with the multi-pin, and then we had the back on it to change it over to I2C to communicate. And this is 16 characters wide by two rows. So it's got a width and a height. This other display here, I might as well use it while I'm finishing off the displays. This is an OLED display. This one actually has 64 uh, bits of light up and down and 128 across. So we can create some basic graphics. This is monochrome. So it's only in one color. There's no backlight because it's actually the lights that we turn on based on that pixel size. So it's 128 across by 64 tall. And from that, we can create various graphics letters and design what we want on that. But it has some better graphics than what we can do on the LCD by itself, but it still has limitations. But the resolution is still fairly slow. The next output item that we have is this one here. This is a uh, 13 segment display. Basically what this is here, it has a chip on the back that takes the wires coming in here, which is a S I squared C signal coming in, and it puts it back out into four numbers or letters and decimal points and lights up the appropriate little bits of LED to create yourself some blocky letters. And I'm sure we've all seen these blocky letters at some point or another turned on. And these can come in various colors. I'm not even sure which color this one is off end, but it doesn't really matter because we're not gonna hook it up today but we will on another time. But anyways, this is just something that we can use for a display. One more output device before we get to input devices is this one here. This is a pulse width modulation. I ran with servos a couple lessons back. This one actually has the ability to connect eight servos up to it. We bring power in on the outside block here. We can bring in power for the servos and then the servos connect up four at one end, four at the opposite end. And again, this is in that feather format so it's the same format as the, the M4, the Feather M4 Express, and fits into the same type of patterns. And this is a, uh, again, designed by Adafruit, but there are others that are not, that you could also use that are 
done by multiple people. Down here I have two boards that are similar. These two boards are very, very similar. Is that these are part of an INA series. This is an INA 219 and an INA 260. What these do is read voltage and current. And I'll show you an, a sample of that later today when I show you a final device working. I'll show you where I've hooked that up with an OLED. And one of these, in fact, it's this one here. It's the 219 that I'm using. And I can actually read the, the voltage and the current on my load with this device. And it will send that information back to the microprocessor. Over here, I have a little temperature and humidity sensor. This is a tiny little board. Again, very tiny little breakout could be hidden somewhere or put somewhere very conveniently for you and then connected with the four wires and we can connect it back to the, the uh, microprocessor and we can read out the temperature and humidity at this location. It has the sensors already built into the board. One more over here. This is kind of a strange one. This is an input device, but it gets sent commands. And this is a, uh, a 10,000 ohm pot. If you remember, I used, up, I used pots on here before for creating signals and I was creating an analog input. Well, I can actually use this one digitally and I can connect it through I2C and I can set it in my program and it's the same as turning a pot and creating an external resistance that I can then hook up to something else. So it actually gives me a variable resistor that I can use and it has some limitations, but in, in other cases where you don't want to actually have a pot connected, but I want to be able to change values to something on a load, I can do it with that. So that's just another little nice little board that you might find uses for here and there. And then finally, let's talk about what we've got here. So I'm going to zoom in a bit. So I'm going to take this Arduino out of the way for now because we're, we're going to come back to that. And I'm going to talk about this one here. So I'm going to zoom in on what we've got here. So hopefully this won't freeze the screen. If it does, we'll just refresh the screen. So what I've got here is I've got a number of devices. And it actually looks like the writing wants to go this way. So we'll, we'll, we'll make it happy and we'll turn it all around. And we'll start with that there. So what we have here is we have a few devices. And so we have this connected and the first one here, and I'll just move those wires out of the way, is a BMP388. And this is temperature and pressure. So as opposed to temperature and humidity, I think this one might actually do that as well, but it definitely does temperature and pressure and it's connected through I squared C. And it This is my humidity sensor here. This is an HST221. So this is a humi humidity sensor. So we'll be looking at that and how that works. We're going to look at the next sensor here, which is kind of a fancy one. This has got a really long title on it. It's, it's an LMS303 AGR, I believe. And it has two built-in I squared C devices in here. It has a magnetometer and it has a gyroscope or uh, is it a gyroscope? Well, I'll have to go back and look at it. No, an accelerometer and a magnetometer. So it actually measures acceleration and magnetic influence. So we'll look at that. We'll look at some basic data that comes out of that. And then the last one here, if it's gonna to try to stay in my picture, it probably won't, my hand's in the way. Let me see if I can get that there. I think that's better. Uh, the wires want to move it. This is a VL6181 uh, X. And this one is, uh, let me think. Oh, this is another board. I think this one has to deal with the amount of light that we're getting. And it is, it's a range and lux. So it actually sends out a signal and in fact, in, on the top of that chip, let's see how close I can get this and still make it visible. Will it zoom in on that? About there, there's a little tiny hole in that center chip. That tiny little hole actually is able to put out a signal and there's a second little hole there. You can actually just see it now with the shine on there. There's a little second dot on the top of that middle chip. So there's a transmitter and a receiver on this chip. So it actually sends out a signal and it bounces back and that tells us how far away something is away from it and while we're at it it also measures the amount of light that's coming in on the sensor so those are the devices we're going to look at now one of the things that we have whenever we're dealing with these items is 
we have to set them up. So we have to understand what's in them first. So let's have a look at our first sketch or our first program in this point. We're gonna do this on the circuit Python because I have all this set up here. So what we do is when we get a new device, we have to find out a few things about it. And one of the things we need to know is its address. Without this address, we're never gonna know what's there. Now, we can find out this address a number of ways. One of the ways is, and I would recommend this, is to look up the information. Go search for it on the net, preferably from where you bought it from or wherever you managed to get it and see if you can find out what the helper files are on it. You might just be able to search and find other people that have used this device and how they're using it and how they're communicating with it. So let's talk about some of the basics that are in this file. So up here, this is just a basic scanner. The first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna scan because I wanna get all the addresses for these boards here. And I wanna know what the addresses are so I can talk to them. So I'm gonna have the, ba I have a basic scanner here and this is original code from Adafruit. I made some changes to it because it only liked to scan one file, the particular code that I found. It only looked for the first address it found and I wanted to be able to scan all of them that are online at the same time. So I made some changes to the code and this is my modified and cleaned up little bit of code here. First thing I do is I bring in my helper files just like I always do. In here, we start out with board and bus IO. Now these are already built into it, so there's no libraries to add. This is just when you first install CircuitPython onto the, in this case, the Feather M4 Express. These are already internal, we're just accessing them. We're telling them we wanna use them, so we wanna import those helper files. The board, because we need to hook up to the connections and bus IO because we're gonna communicate on it. It's communications. So now what we're going to do is we're gonna initialize our communications. So by doing that, we create an, an object called I2C and we're gonna create it equal to the bus O. So in other words, the communication lines dot I squared C, which is an internal bit of this. And we're gonna connect it to the board SCL and the board SDA connection point on this board that are labeled SCL and SDA, so that makes it nice and easy to connect. And it says, while not, and it says, I squared C, try lock. So if it's not, then try locking it. And what that does is once it says, keep doing that until we're done, that's what pass means. So keep doing that. Once it's found out that it's there, hey, it's good to go, we're true. All right, we're gonna keep going. So we're gonna move on to the next part of our program. So the next thing I'm going to do in here is I'm going to find out the number of devices and I'm going to print those results here in my REPL in my serial printer up here that's built into Mu. And I'm going to look at it. So I start out by resetting the number of items. So I, I set the items to zero and it says here devices and uh, actually items is used down further. So this is my count. So I'm going to use devices and I say take a scan of I squared C. So when I take a scan of I squared C, what it does, it comes back with a number of devices and it says there's so many devices. And it will keep track of them and it creates a little, an array of information of all these addresses. Whether it's no addresses, a group of addresses, or, what, or just a single address, it doesn't really matter. It will keep a list of them. And then what I wanna do is I wanna find out how many devices did it find? So I use a variable called num devices equals num for number. So number of devices equals the length of devices. In other words, how many spots in my array did it fill? And then we have a print statement here that just says number of I squared C devices, put in the bracket and just format and we're just gonna print out the number of devices. So it's just going to be a decimal number that we can understand. And then it says, then the next part says print each device address as a hex number. They like to use hex addressing, hex addressing in, in place of decimal addressing. Decimal is base 10. It's what we use all the time. Good morning, Brian. Brian's familiar with these hexadecimals and, and regular decimal numbers. But uh, des decimal is using the numbers zero through nine and hexadecimal uses numbers zero through F. So it actually, when you see addresses every once in a while, especially if you're dealing with communications on the internet, you might see something called a MAC address and it could have letters and numbers in there with separators in between. And this is, that's just hex numbers. 
So that's what we get back from these devices, and the addresses are all in hex. And they go basically from uh, 0 to 77, but then we have to translate them into hex to make more sense out of them to get all 128 that are available to us. So here we go, and um, devices is equal to I scan, and then it says print the device, and it starts out with item zero. In other words, the first bit in the the first word in the array, and we just print the statement found device with address, and then we print the hex value of it there, and then we go to the next one, and we keep doing this until we run out of number of devices, and then once we're done, is we unlock I squared C again to make it open to do things. So let me show you what that looks like. I'm going to open up the serial portion here on the bottom of the screen. And I'm going to hit save because this only runs once. It doesn't continuously run. There was no while true loop in this one. So this only executes once. And we execute it either by resetting the board or we just hit save. And when we hit save, it comes back with this information really fast. So we can see here, there's the information. And it said number of I squared, D, uh, I squared C devices was five. It found five devices, even though we only physically have the four boards here. Remember, this board down here actually has two devices built into it. And it gives me the addresses of 0x19, 0x1e, 0x29, 0x5f, and 0x77. So these, last part of these digits, the 19, the 1e, the 29, the 5f, and the 77, those are all hexadecimal numbers. And so these are the addresses we are going to use to find where everything is based on these numbers. So those are the numbers that would be important to us. If we're searching an item for the first time when I'm scanning it and I'm not sure and I wanna know what device it's address it's set to, basically what I do is I just hook up my scanner software here. I plug in one device either on a breadboard like this or through a cable like this, depending on how it's made. Some of these, I have these quick connectors on them. And I just scan it and I confirm what the address is. Now, in some cases, and these ones as well, but I'm gonna grab one of my other ones here just to show you, is I can actually look at this here. And let me see if I can bring this around a little bit. You can see there's a couple of copper pads over here. So some boards have the ability to have more than one address. So what you do is you solder across the two pads. You solder either a little wire across there or just put a solder joint across it. And it changes the address. So with two pads here, right now neither one is soldered. So it's at whatever its root address is. So we could find that out. We could scan this module right now and we could find out its address. And then it has an A0 and an A1 beside it. So if we jumpered out A0, the address would increase by one digit. So if it was 19, for instance, it would become 1A would be the next increment of the digit. E and F. And if we did 1A, it would increase by two places. If we did both of them, it would increase by three places. So this one actually has the ability of four different addresses. What that allows me to do this reads current and voltage, this particular board. Let's see if we can get the focus in. So this one reads current and uh, current and voltage. So it would allow me to hook up four of these boards and have all of them talking back to my microprocessor so I could have multiple boards reading voltage and current. So that's the beauty of this right here. So that allows me to do something like that. So that's what multiple addresses allow me to do. So let me just close up that little bottom window. We did our scan and it's not gonna change anymore. So I'm gonna go ahead and close that little window up at the bottom. And what I'm gonna do is I'm now gonna choose to talk to one of these devices. And why don't we talk with this, start with this B, uh, this BMP388 and just talk to it. And I'm gonna show you one and then I'm gonna show you a big example here. So I'm gonna go up here to my program and I'm gonna load in. I have, I have these programs already saved because I was doing this to make sure everything worked nice. So I'm gonna go up here and I'm gonna open up a file and you're gonna see it pop up here in a second. Uh, maybe, maybe not. Where is my file? Yeah, it's gonna be in here. There we go. 
So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to look at... Yeah, this is an I square C simplified all are connected. I didn't even change the information at the top. But this one here, I am going to talk to my first board. And this is called the BMP388. So this is the one here that's going to measure temperature and pressure. So that's what we're going to print out here. So what I need to do is I need to import my helper files, just like I did before. I'm going to import time because I want to create some delays. Board, bus IO, board because I need to attach to pins, bus IO because I want to use communications. And then I import a helper file called Adafruit underscore BMP3XX. They make a series of these boards that start with this number. And this is the file that works with all of them. So this particular board uses that helper file. And you can I found that out on the Adafruit Learn site. or And that's where you want to find these things out. If you're buying from another manufacturer, check it out or search other sites. There's on the GitHub. There's so many different places to search. And you'll have to just find out which driver works best for you. So now I'm going to set up the, the board. So I just set up I squared C. Again, it's just bus I squared C board, SCL board SDA. Those are my pins. And then I'm going to create an image called BMP, an object. And it uses the file Adafruit underscore BMP3XX. Inside of that, I'm going to call up the I squared C protocol. So I'm going to call that up to say what information I want to send. And then the only other thing I do with this particular board, it recommends setting some sampling rates. What happens is if you only read and you only use one sample for your item, you'll find it jumps around a lot. So what they do is to help smoothen out your data, you do a bunch of samples. So they set these as the default sample rates that they like to use for that board. So I just left them. You can experiment with those later. And now my loop. This is the big loop here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have the pressure and it's going to be, I'm going to take the pressure and the temperature. And then what I've done here is I've created a print statement. And let me explain what this is a little bit. So this here, first of all, this is going to allow for a whole bunch of digits. And we're going to see how that works. But this was 61F. And this is a format. And this is 5.2F. Well, the dot one, so this is six overall, which means there's going to be four numbers a dot, a decimal, and it's going to be in a decimal format because it's F. It's a, it's a floating point number. So it's a decimal type number. So it's four decimal and then one digit. This one here is three numbers, a decimal, and two spots after the decimal. So that again is a floating point number. And then we just say format it. And then we're going to print out those values. BMP pressure and BMP temperature. And if you notice, I didn't have to read them anywhere else. These actually grab the values. And then I'm going to sleep for one second so it's not constantly repeating. Now, my simplest way to do this today, and i got to be careful about this because I don't want to overwrite my scanning file. But I'm going to copy this. I'm going to go over to this screen. And I'm going to paste that there. And if we did, it all came up in here. I'm going to close the original file. This was the one connected to my board. So now I'm going to hit save. Let's open up the serial port. I'm going to hit save. And when I do, it overwrote what was on here, what was on the M4 Express. And now I'm printing out this information. So you can see here, I'm printing. And it came out here at the top. And it's scrolling down and it's reading it. And I've got a pressure of 101, uh, 1001.5 today. And I've got a temperature of 23.94. And that's in Celsius. If I put my finger on it, you'll see that it will increase. That number is increasing because my finger is warmer than the room is. That's why we like air conditioning. I have my windows open today and it is a warm day. If I take my finger back off of there, we'll see it starts to lower. But it's going to take a little while because the air has to flow across it. But it'll slowly drop down to roughly where it was, that 23 degrees again. So as the chip is cooling, with air running across it now, just in the open air, we can see that we are getting a correction in our temperature. So it is starting to drop. So right off the bat, we were able to make this one work. So that's not bad. So right away, we were able to do something with it. 
This is fairly accurate. Um, you have to look at the file profiles to figure out what pressure is and what it, what scale it's in and everything else. But we're going to go to a more advanced feature here. We're going to load up a file that actually has all of these devices connected to it. And we're going to see what the results are because you can combine multiple devices together. And I want to show you that and talk about it before we move on to the Arduino. Let's do that. So I'm going to close the serial port here. You can see my temperature is still lowering. It's, it's slow coming back down, but we're getting closer. So let me just go down here, close the serial port, and now I'm going to open up a new file. And in this particular case here, I'm going to get one with all my devices. And we can see that right here, this is a lot longer program. It's not really very long though. It's only 59 rungs. So let's grab all of this. I'm gonna copy that and I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna overwrite what's in here on the one that's connected to the chip. I'm gonna close my original file again so I don't accidentally save on it. Let's open up the serial monitor so we can see what's happening. It's still reading the information from the existing chip. But here, let's save this. And look at all this information that's pulling up now, wow. And I've actually formatted this quite a bit different. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at this. So we can look at the first thing here is I can see right now that says there's a range of 255 millimeters. That was that fourth board that's over here. This is the range. In fact, if you look at it very finely in there, you might see the light blink that's in there. And that is the sensor blinking to send out a signal that the receiver can see back. So that's what it's doing there. It's also reading in amount of light is 68.8 lux. If I put my hand over it to shadow it, we'll see that number lowered to 12, but we also got a range because I put my fingers in front of the sensor. It's actually picking up how far my hand is. I move my hand away. We can see that number increases for the range. It's up to 138, 137, 142, 149, 181. And then at some point it just gets too far to read. So it defaults back out to 255. Now, is that accurate? Uh, maybe, maybe not. Most of these boards will allow you to calibrate the outputs. And in all honesty, you probably want to calibrate the outputs. You want to go through and do that. I'm not going to do that here. They have whole lessons on how to do that for each individual board. There's just too, way, too many to worry about. Yeah, the next thing I'm looking at here is I'm going to look at is this is the BMP388. That's our first board we were looking at over here. This one here, there's my pressure, 101, uh, 1001.5. And my temperature is now down to 24.21. It's getting closer to that 23 again. The next board that I have up in here, that's the one that's kind of off the screen a little bit. This is the HTS221. This is humidity relative humidity and temperature, it's got both in there. And you can see I didn't have my finger on it, so it's in the 23, 23.4 degrees Celsius. Humidity is at 50.09, or about 50% relative humidity, RH, relative humidity. It was raining here last night, um, it rained quite a bit. It's actually a little humid outside today. And like I say, I have my windows open, so my humidity is sitting at 49%, at 50% right now. And then the last sensor, in here which is actually this one here in the in the middle spot so you can see I don't have to put these in any particular order on my list I can print them out in any order I want this has got an accelerometer into it which is meters per second squared and then micro Tesla's for the magnetic and if I pick this up and I move it up the Z value or Z value changes I can see that that changes if I turn it or actually tilt it there's my Y has gone to a minus 10 value. I tilted the other way, I got plus 10. If I face it up, it's gonna bring up my X value. Flat is gonna be close to zero. And in fact, if I point it down, I can get it down into the negatives. So it's giving me acceleration based on direction. So I have acceleration and magnetometer. I have those things already. The magnetometer will help me sort out if I figure it all out and I can get this, I could actually point out and figure out where true north is. So there is calibration that is definitely required for this particular board. 
and outside influence that can affect it, but we can measure the strength of magnetic fields and directions of things. So we can go through and we can do a bunch of things with these settings. These are very technical settings. They require a lot of calibration, but this board is capable of doing that. So that's just one thing that we can do with this type of a board. So that's the type of thing. So let's have a look at our program to see how this is built. So way up at the top here, I just have some information at the top. I've imported my helper files. So I've taken a number of files, number of programs that were written by different people, most of them from Adafruit or people from Adafruit. And I've imported everything I've needed. So I've imported time because I need to create delays. My board, my busso. So my board to attach to pins, my busso to communicate. And then I've imported the five helper files needed. I said there was four boards, but I got five helper files. This is the one that does range and lux is the, v, the VL6180X. There's my original BMP3XX. That was my uh, humidity and pressure. HTS221, that is uh, humidity and temperature. And then I have the last two are for the same board. This is the LSM303 acceleration, and then the LIS2MDL, which is the magnetometer portion of that board. So that's all the boards there. Then I set up all the boards and I tell them to turn on. So what I've done here is I create my IO bus, my uh, I squared C bus here again with I2C. Then I add the five sensors, the five sensor readings I wanna read, and I create objects for each one of those and just based on the information that I get our helper file. Again, I have my pressure and temperature oversampling rates that I put in here. And then the rest of this is in the loop. So first of the thing I do is I can do the range is really simple. I grab my range in millimeters and I take it from sensor range because I called that sensor sensor. And then I come in here and I can do the range and I can format it based on the gain. And then what it does, it prints out that gain and it also prints out then my light value from the Lux, light Lux. So all of this is internal. It all comes from the one board that's taken care of. The next I'm gonna look is at the BMP388. Well, here's my pressure and my temperature. So there's my same formats that I used before. I just broke them into separate lines. Here's my humidity and temperature. And this is all the information on how to print it out. The next one is the acceleration and the magnetometer. You can see these are getting to be quite long lines. The, the words are big, so they take up more room. And then finally, I just print a blank space and I delay for one second. What that results in is this information you're seeing here. So there's a lot there. I know there is, but this is I squared C. And the beauty is I could have used just one of these devices if that's all I wanted to use for this project or I can use multiple I squared C devices on the same project. And this will allow me to create the greatest flexibility to my inputs and outputs. Minimal wiring required. All of this is done with, with only the two connections going out here, two for power and common, the other two for the communications. And the rest of it's just daisy chain. And the only thing, remember, Every one of these has to have a unique address. Every, every device needs a unique address so I can talk to it. That way I can identify it. But we can do a lot with this. So that's how we set it up when we're going to do it on CircuitPython. Now there's a lot of detail in here. Like I say, there's helper files galore. There are, all of these are, these all happen to be Adafruit devices because they were simple to use. So you could go to the Adafruit Learn Guides and you could grab all the information for these. And in fact, you can grab most of the information you need for all of these devices, whether you're using Arduino or CircuitPython because they, cover, they carry and they write files, helper files for both. So we're gonna look at the Arduino now because we have to do the same type of thing there. So let's have a look at the Arduino. So let me just move this one out of the way and I'm gonna steal these parts off of here because we're gonna need these which is not gonna make this board very happy. We're getting an error flashing light, but we're gonna move it out of the way. And we're gonna bring our Uno board in here. So there's our Uno board. So right off the bat, wiring. 
So I'm going to go ahead and plug my board into there. So I've done that. And I'm going to take my other sensors. Here they are here. I'm just going to lay them up. Uh, I'm going to figure out where to lay them in a moment. So you can see, you can't see them all, but that's okay. And I'm going to take these wires and I'm going to connect those to their appropriate colors. That's the other reason why I used the colors I did is because it, it all matched and made it easier for me to remember how to hook these back up in between. So here I am. We've done this same basic thing. This is just sitting over top. I'm just making sure it's not touching anything. One of them's off the board. Let's see if we can't swing. I don't know if I can swing that around and keep the others. They're all kind of on the screen there. There we go. So we have our Uno. We have our same sensors we just used on our CircuitPython connected here. And again, these are connected up through with the blue and the yellow are connected over here and they're connected to A4 and 5, which are your SCL and SDA pins. They're the same as the two that are up here if they're marked on the front of the other more modern versions of the UNO. And then we also have the, the black and the red for power, which are just connected across here to the five volts and other. If you notice on my other one, I actually ran these at 3.3 volts. Now I'm running the same boards at five volts. These boards are able to work with either voltage. So let me change out my code now. Let me switch code so we can see what's happening here. And this is the code here. And we'll just move that up like that. This is my basic code for here. And this is my scanner program. So this is the same thing I started with when I did the other one. Hey, good morning, Walter. Just in time for the Arduino portion. I was just finished doing CircuitPython. So now what I'm going to do is I have a, a scanner program here. And this idea of the scanner program is basically what we've done before. Again, these are all available. These are not hidden files. These are just files. And all I've done is clean them up a little bit sometimes. But the information is available either from the, you can come up here to file and you can open up the, the basics for this information or the manufacturers. So what I've done here is I've included any helper files I need here. Well, in Arduino, we need to include the one called wire.h. Wire.h is carries the communication protocol. Communications, in this case, I squared C, so that we can talk to things properly. So that's what this does for us. It sets up the communications. Next thing we do is I created some variables that I'm gonna need inside of my program, my sketch down below. And in my setup is very short. There's only two things to set up in the setup. One is the wire begin to tell it to start the I, I squared C connection and the serial begin to tell it to start the serial monitor. Inside the program, this program's a little bit longer but it has a little bit more error checking involved than my basic one did in my uh, CircuitPython version. Basically, we just start out with end device is equal zero just to reset the number scan because this is going to be a loop. We're going to say what we're scanning. And then it's going to look at all the addresses from 1 to 127. So basically from the beginning 1 to 127. It's going to look at all the available addresses for I squared C and it's going to create information for those. But unlike saving in the array like the other one this did, this one's going to print them out one at a time as we find them. So it's just going to start at the bottom of the address list and carry on down. If we find an address, in other words, if the arrow is, error is equal to zero, in other words, there was no error, then it's going to say I squared C device found at address and it's going to print that and then it's going to give you the address. If the address happens to be less than 16, it's going to write zero. The first few addresses are reserved addresses in the I squared C protocol. So that we're not going to worry about. The next thing in here is the hex address. And then it's going to increase this number by one and it would go back up and repeat this as we're going through the loop. So that's what the end devices is. This is we're going through this for loop. So we're going to repeat this for loop. If it didn't find any devices or it, it had an error that's equal to four, it's going to say, hey, there was, an ad there was an address here that I found, but it's not working right. So it's going to print it up as an error. And then the last thing it does is if it doesn't find any in the top part, if the devices, number of devices happens to be zero, 
it's going to say there were none found. In other words, there was none on the network at the time. So it's going to give me a case where there's no addresses found. So I can look at all these things. So let's look at the serial monitor. I have this thing hooked up and running. And this is running right now. This should be running. In fact, we should see this update. Yeah, it just blinked. So what it did, it came up with an I squared C address device found at there's 191E295F and 77. Those are the hex addresses exactly the same as my scanner program in CircuitPython found. This is founding the same group of addresses. So we have five addresses available to us. It's finding them and it's the same boards that are plugged in. So they should be the same addresses, but this confirms that I can at least talk to them. And that was the first thing that I was I wanted to do. So right off the bat, we're good here. So we actually see what we're looking for here. So I'm just gonna put that in the background again because I don't need to see that right away. So that was my first thing for scanning. Now, I'm gonna save you a lot of time because I don't wanna be here for the next half hour doing talking about each individual file. So I'm gonna bring in the fully loaded program. So I'm gonna go up here to my file and I'm gonna come down here to recent and I think I have it on here doing let me just click open and I'm gonna go in here do I have one for all of them in here da, da, da. that's an Arduino Arduino grab one of these and do it we did the BMP 388 test before so why don't we grab that one and we're going to open that file and then I got to bring it over to this window because it's in the wrong part of the page and let's look at that first file I didn't I don't think I created a completely combined version like I did on the other one so here we are here so this is our sample file so this is in here we're going to include our helper files that we need so we're going to include something called wire.h again so that's our turn on the i squared c let's turn that on on the arduino from adafruit we need two helper files now this one here is called sensor.h sensor.h is just a, a general overall sensor file and then this one adafruit bmp388 or 3xx.h is the one specific to that board but it requires Adafruit sensor to also be loaded in because it has some information that's used by multiple other boards, but it's also needed by this one. And then what we're going to have in here is we have a num another value here, and this is all in capitals, not the way I like to write a tag, but they, they created a tag called Sea Level Pressure HPA. So what this is, this is a value that's created and you can go on to the weather services and you can find out what your barometric pressure is for your area. Now this one says un under normal conditions, mine would be, or this one would have been at uh, 1,018. That was just happened to be what that was. And it says set up the board. Here it is, adafruit.bmp. So again, this was just setting the tag BMP is equal to adafruit BMP. 3xx so basically that's just setting up our object that we need and then we move on into the setup again the setup we turn on the serial monitor we turn on the ice we turn on the device so we turn on the sensor in here we have oversampling remember I said this BMP device likes to have some sampling rates done these were the default sampling rates that they had for working with uh, the samples that we're going to get the information because this is actually going to print a third piece of information that's a calculated information. And uh, you can actually get into altitude here. So we're going to see how that works for us. So in here, I've broken it down into the bottom part. What have I done? I've got three print statements. First one is the temperature is going to equal something. The pressure is going to equal to something. And then the last one is we're going to actually work in the altitude. And let's see how close this is to where I am. So... One thing you might have asked is where do I find these in the libraries? Well, when you're including this at the top and you want to include all these things, you go include library. When you go to your library, you may not have it. In fact, if I scroll down here, you'll see that I have contributed libraries because I've added these. 
I've added a bunch of libraries onto here. And there's actually a few more even down further you can't see. Because they scroll outside of this window that I'm able to view in for this server. But basically there would have been the one for the BMP3XX. If that didn't exist, the top and I would say manage libraries. Remember when we manage libraries, we pull up a screen that looks like this. And what I would do here is I would just type in the name of my sensor here. So for one of the ones I don't have in here currently, I'll look up that sensor that I brought in earlier that I said reads voltage and current. So that's this little sensor right here. I'm going to bring in here one for the INA219. So I'm going to look up here INA219. And what it's going to come down here is, oh, it's got two versions here. Now, there is an INA current sensor. This is by Adafruit. And this is just an Arduino INA219. And this was written by somebody else. Now, because this board is made by Arduino, or by Adafruit, I should say, I would take the Adafruit version here. And this one here might be one that I would use if I bought one off of eBay or from somewhere else and say, hey, use the Arduino INA219 file. And you could actually find out more about it. So there's things like here that says more info. It actually opened up a browser screen that you don't see right now. And it goes to the person's GitHub in this case. In my case here, I'm looking for this. They have previous versions, so they've been updating them. I'm going to take that. I'm just going to show you installed. Updating the list of installed libraries. It's now there. And I'm going to close this. If I go back up here now to sketch, and I go down here to include library, and I scroll down to this list, and you can't see it because it's off the page. It's down below the liquid crystal. There's actually one there listed now that says INA219. So that's actually one of the uh, libraries that I've added to this. So I could use that at a future date if I wanted to. So I can set that up and use that with a sensor reader. And I have used that one in Arduino before. I've used it and I'll show you a little example of that when we're almost finished here today. Anyway, this last little thing here, I'm gonna take this now, I'm gonna to go to my tools. I'm showing I'm connected to my Arduino Uno. So we're gonna go ahead and upload this. So we're gonna ignore the rest of the sensors. I'm gonna go here and I'm gonna compile the sketch. Believe it or not, it's actually working underneath. I know that's slightly out of your page to see because it's slightly below, it says compiling. It should compile and now it says it's uploading it. In fact, these little lights seem to be on pretty steady there. They just went out. Let me open up this. I open up my serial monitor. You can now see it. Now, I can tell you right now that things are out a little bit here because I am not at 136 or 137 meters above sea level. I'm actually a little lower than that. Uh, when we checked our pressure earlier, what did we have? We have 101 today was our actual pressure today. So what I would need to do is I'd have to set up the calibration and everything else. And then once I've done that, I would get a reasonably accurate me method of reading it. If this says it's 101 today, let's do this. I'm going to check that and see what it does to our altitude. We're going to let that finish uploading. So there it is at 137. And now, because it matches, oh, look at that. It actually tells me that I'm below. I'm below sea level. So that probably wasn't the best thing for me to do was to set it to 101. But we did. A good thing or not. Let's see, what did we have down here? I'm going to turn off auto scroll. I just want to scroll back up. Yeah, my 101 has stayed steady. For my normal area, I think I'm supposed to be 112. Let's try that. Let's try taking that out and putting it around 112. And if I upload that, let's see what kind of values we get. So we're playing with it, 
And this is where the fine tuning and finding out what you are, what is your normal pressure for your area. And if you come out right, I should come out somewhere just below 100 meters, I believe. Because I'm about 300 feet above sea level here. Might be 330 feet at the most. Turn on the auto scroll. And I'm still probably a little low on my number because it's showing me at 87.21 meters, which is not quite right. But I'm actually in a low pressure cell for today if I'm supposed to normally be at 112. Maybe I'm 113. But there's my 23 degrees still that I was sitting at before for my house temperature at the moment. We're not getting much of a breeze through here. And it's showing me at 87 meters of altitude, which is a little on the low side. I'm actually a little bit higher than that. So anyways, we can see we can fine tune these devices and we can actually get it reading. And once we get them reading right, they're good and they'll be accurate for where I am. The beauty of that is, is if I were to go outside, we have an escarpment in height. If I were to go out there and I go up to the top of the escarpment, I would see my new altitude and it would increase by. It would increase by about that much from where I from where I am right now. So we can actually see those things going on. So that was what I wanted to show you there, is that we can do this for each individual one. The key here is, is to look up the sensor that you need, add the helper file to your Arduino libraries, and then you utilize it in, in here. And if you have no idea where to begin with one of these, there's a nice little feature in here. When we look under, and once we've installed the library, if I go to file, I can go to examples. And the examples are now on your board. So as I scroll down here and I look, here is the fact there's that INA 219 that I looked at. And I could actually do, there's two examples here. One is doing a power load or uh, power OLED. And then there's something here called get current. So there's a couple of sample files. If I look at this BMP, there's my simple test. If I wanna look at my accelerometer board here, uh, actually the accelerometer boards down here there's the sensor board right underneath it is the magnetometer first one listed there's actually four they're just scrolling off the screen it says calibration the humidity there's the test and undefined sensor so you actually have a couple of different settings you can use there and there's a whole bunch of different ones that we can get so I've installed these helper files and now there are samples in here to help figure it out Sample for wire, hey, look at that. They have an I squared C scanner file, which is the what I used as my base for creating my scanner file, which was just a slightly changed version of that. There's also the digital potentiometer one that's in here for wire. So that might work with that digital potentiometer I have. I'm not sure, I'd have to check that out. Master reader, master writer. So those are things here to create the signals that you would create from the processor. And then you have slave receive and sender, so you can have a device out in the field. So there's all kinds of something about a ranger here, reader, I'm not sure what that one is. But there's lots of different sample files on all of this stuff. So don't be scared to experiment. This is the beauty of this stuff, is you can experiment and you can play around with it and figure out what's happening. So always play around with them, find the helper files, search the ones you need, and I think you'll find you'll be in pretty good shape. So that's basically how they work on both Circuit Playground and on on uh, Circuit Playground or Circuit Python using the Adafruit board, the Express M, the M4 Express, or using Arduino. And today I was using an Uno, very common board in the Arduino world. You can create multiple I squared C devices connected to a single source get lots of information from it, and you can build these into your projects. This is actually can be quite complicated, but there's tons and tons and tons of devices out there. So let me just show you one that's a... And one of the guys watching this right now, he'll recognize this. In fact, I'm gonna zoom back out a little bit because it's a little too close. I'll probably zoom back in. But this is a little testing board. This is built on an Arduino Uno. And this was built for working with NeoPixels. So you might be familiar with, remember the NeoPixels, but what we have is two I squared C devices on here. I have one of those INA 
219, 219 current and voltage boards here. That's plugged in on this board. I also have this small OLED screen. I have four pots connected and everything else. So let me just turn that on. And we're gonna zoom in on those other screens, so don't worry about that. But what I wanna show you is, this is really bright. And I know it's bright and luckily it's off to the side. The beauty of this is, is I can turn this down. So I can get that very dim. And right now my colors look pretty white. Well, if I bring these number letters down, believe it or not, that's actually showing as very red. I don't know. You can kind of see the reflection there. It's a little bit on the red side. I can take that down. I can bring up the blue color. You can see it kind of goes to a bluish tint. And of course I could bring it up to a green, which is definitely hard to see in this case. There it is, oh, blown out, blown out green. Blown out green. I'm just gonna do this. Blown out red. And blown out blue. The beauty of this board is something that we've done here is uh, this is also the brightness control is this other one on the outside. And then there's one more control knob here that allows me to select how many NeoPixels I've done. So let me just zoom in on the board portion of it. And in fact, we'll probably bring that around this way. It looks like it's mostly in focus. If I bring that up a bit more, let me see if I, it'll improve the focus or not. Eh, not bad. It, you can almost see. In fact, there we go. I'm going to try to position this here. So what I've done here on this, this particular project, this is using I2, two I, I squared C devices. So this OLED here is actually, this OLED right here is telling me the red, the green, and the blue. And these are the percentage I have up on the dial. So as I increase this, you can see my numbers increasing. And it actually goes from zero to 255, the full range is based on that pot and I have the same thing for green and I have the same thing for blue now I know this is all moving while I'm trying to turn these so I'm gonna have to try and hold it and the other part of this underneath that it says current milliamps and I'm reading running about 60 milliamps right now and that's actually running through this board up here the INA 219 DC in fact you can even see those solder pads on there now pretty clear and then the brightness is set at about 57 or 60 percent in that area in fact i can take this i could turn this all the way up to 100 to 128 which is the full setting this is done on the arduino so it's actually done for the arduino settings down to zero. Oh, pardon me there's my level of zero i think i went from zero to 100 yeah i did so that's 100 percent. so let me take it and set it to about 0.3 or 30 percent is what we run most of our we find that most of the time we can run our NeoPixels at 20 to 30%. And we usually have more than enough light to see what we're doing. So that's at 30% right now. I'll take all my colors and turn them up to full. So in other words, my, my R, my G, and my B, my red, my green, and my blue, which is basically white. And at 30% brightness, I can see right now for 24 lights is how many are connected. I can actually see that I'm drawing about 110, 112 milliamps in that area. So I'm actually bouncing around. I'm actually bouncing around from about 110 to about 117. So less than 120 milliamps. Now, if I take those same lights and I bring each one of these down halfway, which is about 127, 128, we'll get them close. They don't have to be exact. They're pretty close there. I can see I've actually dropped my load down in 70 milliamps. So we can actually see what that does. The, there's, this does two things for me. One, it tells me how much current my 24 NeoPixels are drawing. And the second thing that it does for me here is it's really handy, is it lets me adjust my colors. So if I come back over here and I look at my colors just in frame there, 
and in fact I probably just can't quite get it I don't think I can there we go so if I want a little more blue I can add more blue bring blue up to full I'll take my green down now I have my magenta color coming out of it and in fact I can make it more and more blue with just a hint of the magenta in it and I can see what my new current draw is and I can also tell what my three settings are for my colors so anytime this is a color tester board that I built under the uh, Brian wanted me to build something like this we talked about this so I did this is a board that allows me to do this kind of stuff and in fact since we don't need that code anymore there we go we can even zoom it up you can even see it bigger you can see those numbers are quite clear you know they're they're actually work pretty good and we can actually see how much current this draws for the type of light if we wanted a little different color if we take the green add a little blue to it we can turn it to teal or we can take this one down add the green and the red and we get a yellow color so we can now manipulate the color find the color we're looking for and we can set it based on those readings so we can do a fair bit with this so this was just an example the main purpose of this today was not to go through this code because this code is reasonably long there's a lot of features in here but it was to take the fact that we took and two different I squared C devices and you can actually see the VSC, VCL and VDA connections are on the OLED there and we've taken it and we're talking back to the UNO and we've done the same thing with the voltage and current board so this allows me to tie everything into here to keep it all going so anyways that's about what I've got for today so that's what I wanted to talk about so today we covered a little bit about I squared C we covered it on the circuit python and the arduino we were able to scan it on either one and to scan out and find out what devices we had connected and then i showed you a practical project here at the very end and in the meantime i showed you a bunch of the boards and what can be done in between so those are your choices those are your things you can play with for today continue on learn about i squared c a little bit more there are a couple of resistors that are built into all of the almost all of the boards uh, in fact there's two tiny resistors and the reason for those is is they give you what they call pull downs on the communication line one is connected to the SCL the other is connected to SDA sometimes you'll see something that says hey there's no pull down resistors or, or pull up resistors installed and it's because it can't find them because there's no devices connected they're usually on the slave devices not on the master they're there for a reason please use them use the recommended values that are out there and have fun with this just give it a try start playing with some devices it takes a little while to get used to this load up the helper files you need whether and search them out whether it would be in circuit uh, python or whether it be in uh, the arduino language it doesn't really matter and enjoy have fun with this i hope you've enjoyed this this has been another episode of microcontrollers with kinger north this was episode nine Let's talk I squared C communications and circuit Python and Arduino. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you have, please give me a thumbs up on the uh, YouTube video. If uh, you want more information or you're looking to uh, find out when shows are going to happen, you can always follow me on my Twitter account. It's at Kinger North is my handle on Twitter. And by all means, drop me a note let me know what's going on if you have a question ask me in either twitter or in youtube i will try to answer them until later we'll be back next week i hope with episode 10 i'll figure out between now and then what we're going to do and i'll announce it probably on friday i'll send out my uh, twitter notice about it and i'll get it up onto youtube and have fun have fun with your electronics and play give it a try thanks very much